my clock is showing 1102, so I think this is probably a good time to go ahead and, and get rolling again. Welcome everyone to our, our weather year in review. Uh, this is something that we've done at the state climate office for each of the past three or four years now. So uh, it's always a, an exciting time, at least for me, uh, to be able to, to come to you with, with some information, news about what's happened in our weather over the last year. And, and we always get great feedback about this as well. So hopefully it's something that'll be uh, valuable to all of you. Uh, we'd ask folks to type a, an answer in the, the chat window to this question. So uh, I'll ask Bobby, who's our new office administrator, uh, if she could just summarize some of the answers, Bobby, are there any that uh, have gotten a, a lot of attention that a lot of folks seem to remember from the last year? So we have um, hurricane activity um, started earlier than I recall from the past. We have uh, recent rain with flooding in Forsyth County, especially the flooding of the Yatkin in Tanglewood Park. Someone just put serious rain events. Watching Jordan Lake from drought around October to now, uh, going from a drought to 10 inches of rain in two months. Wake County had a very dry summer and a very wet winter and fall. The amounts of rainfall within a 24 hour period, the cold extremes, rain, dry and gardening challenges, uh, someone said the never ending heat at the end of the summer after the never ending rain at the end of the spring. And then we have the wildfire smoke during the summer. Wind. And that's pretty much it. Um, early summer drought. The, those are all outstanding answers. Thanks everyone for sharing. We'll talk about several of those here uh, during our year in review, but I think a lot of folks are remembering both what's happened recently, but also what's happened a little far uh, longer ago, which I know can be tough when we've had so much eventful weather here uh, just over the last few months. So uh, let, let's go ahead and, and get rolling now. Uh, my name is Corey Davis. I'm one of our assistant state climatologists at the North Carolina State Climate Office. Uh, was hoping we'd be joined today by Dr. Kathy Dello, who's our state climatologist. Uh, she's on the road this morning, so I think there may be some uh, technical difficulties with her getting uh, joined in and being able to, to get connected to the, the audio. So hopefully she'll be able to join us at some point during the webinar. But if not, then I think uh, between me and, and Bobby, we should be able to to take care of the of the bulk of this. Uh, just logistics wise, uh, I think most folks already have, but please uh, make sure that you're muted and that your video is off just to conserve bandwidth for everybody. Uh, we'll start off with a, a presentation going over the past year in North Carolina's weather and climate. Uh, as you have questions during that time, please type those into the chat. Uh, at the end, we'll uh, go through some of those uh, with a quick Q&A in any time uh, that we have left at the end. Uh, as we're getting started, I want to make sure that folks are aware of who we are at the State Climate Office. I assume a lot of folks are probably familiar with us, but if you're not, uh, our office is a public service center for the state of North Carolina. We're housed at North Carolina State University, but we do work uh, with many different groups and organizations all across the state and even across the Southeast region. I like to describe our job at the Climate Office uh, is helping people make better decisions, especially uh, that are affected by weather and climate. And we do that by taking the data, the information, the expertise that we have, and tra translating that into ways that are useful, uh, that are helping people to better make those decisions. Our, our office operates the North Carolina Econet, which is a collection of 40-some weather stations all across the state. Uh, in addition, uh, we're constantly sharing weather data uh, via our website, uh, to folks that need it, uh, and also working on, on partnerships and projects with different organizations all across the state. Uh, so again, proud to have been uh, at the office myself. Uh, now this is my 16th year, and the Climate Office itself has been serving the, uh, the folks in North Carolina now for many decades. So as we get going, we wanted to start with 
just a basic overview of North Carolina's weather and climate in 2023. This is always one of my favorite times of the year, not only because we get to talk to you fine folks again, but also because I, I see this as really the first chance to tell the story or at least write the first draft of how we'll remember this year, uh, at least in terms of our weather and climate in the state. So starting off with our temperatures over the last year, when we look at a statewide average across all 12 months of the year, 2023 came out as tied for the seventh warmest year on record, uh, dating back to 1895. Uh, you can see that our statewide average temperature was more than a degree warmer than the recent 30 year average. In some ways, this number is probably not too surprising because it's right in line with the recent trends. Uh, every year since 2015 has been warmer than average for North Carolina. And during that nine year period, we have measured six of our top 10 warmest years on record. So again, 2023 is right in line with some of the other recent warm years uh, that we've seen across the state. Uh, one thing that may be a little surprising, though, is that it ended up being this warm of a year, considering how cool it was to start the summer. At least personally, I know I tend to judge the warmth of a year based on how many months of that oppressive summer heat that we deal with, and it really didn't start off all that warm. Uh, we'll switch over to this graph that shows uh, month by month throughout the year how our temperatures compare to the long-term average. And you can see back in May and June, we were several degrees below average. So again, not a hot start to the summer. But what we also see from this graph is how warm the rest of the year was. And in fact, the warmest times of year compared to those long-term averages were in our coolest months of the year. Uh, during the wintertime in January and February, getting into the spring in March and April, and then by the end of the year again in December as we came into this winter. So even though we had a couple of cooler months back at the start of the summer, the rest of the year, the other 10 months of the year, were all at or above those long-term average levels. So that's how we get to that seventh warmest year on record. Now looking at some of the local conditions across the state, I think the thing that really stands out are the areas in red. These are places that recorded their warmest year on record in 2023. Uh, Raleigh is one that stands out, and you can see the Raleigh and Durham areas both had uh, their warmest years on record. Uh, I've also put red dots here over Wilson and then down in Laurenburg. Those are other weather stations where we have long-term observations uh, going back more than 70 years, and both of those sites also had their warmest year on record in 2023. Aside from that, fairly widespread warmth that ranked in one of the top 10% of all years. Uh, you can see the Wilmington and Newburn areas were around their fourth warmest year on record. Charlotte was tied for its second warmest year on record. And then in the western part of the state, Asheville tied for its third warmest year on record. So uh, there was really no escaping the overall warmth in 2023. Every corner of the state was generally uh, at least near or in the top 10 warmest on record uh, last year. As one other interesting way of visualizing our temperatures over the last year, I wanted to share this, and this is an, a project that my sister took on uh, beginning at the, the beginning of 2023. She is a very artistic, a very creative and crafty person, so, so she decided that she wanted to knit a blanket where every day she would add a new row to the blanket that corresponded to that day's high temperature in the Greensboro area, which is where she lived. Uh, so she was able to get that data off of our website and very diligently every day she added a row to the blanket and you can see on the on the left how it turned out. I think it's really a, a great way of seeing what our temperatures looked like over the last year. Early on, she had commented how warm the blanket was looking, not just to be covered up by, but also in terms of those warm colors. Uh, we didn't have that many of these kind of lavender to, to blue colors in the winter. There were only a, a few cases of that in January and in late February. Most of February was very warm. You can see a lot of the yellows where temperatures were getting into the 70s. After that, you can see again that kind of delayed uh, into spring and start to summer. We were on into May and June before we started getting into the oranges here with temperatures in the 80s. But once we got there at the beginning of July, we were pretty much stuck with that heat for the next couple months. Uh, a number of 90 degree days here uh, over July and August. And you, you see that transition back to the fall, but with a few of those warmer days uh, in October and even early November up in the 80s uh, still mixed in here. And finally, we see uh, the, the cooler temperatures returning by December. 
but still fairly warm overall. A lot of days in the 50s, which is at or a little bit above normal uh, for that time of the year. So again, I think uh, an interesting way to look at how our temperatures varied last year. Uh, switching over to our precipitation, uh, 2023 was the 61st driest year on record, again, based on data going back uh, 129 years to 1895. Uh, the statewide average came out to be a little over two inches drier uh, than the recent 30-year average. That's also probably not too surprising, especially when you remember uh, the very dry fall that we had in October and November. Uh, and that's also very evident here on the monthly departures from average. For the most part, though, we pretty much switched back and forth and bounced between a little bit wetter than normal, a little bit drier than normal, and near normal like we saw back in, in the start of the summer. We had some wet months. April stands out, December stand out, even August stands out as being a little wetter than normal. And we had some dry months in there, but of course the, the most prominent dry stretch was back during the fall, really between the middle of September and late November. It was our 16th driest fall on record and our 10th driest October on record in North Carolina. Uh, so because of that, we started to see a lot of those precipitation deficits really begin to accumulate. We did get some nice help in terms of that rain in December. So that's why we finished close to average, but still a little bit below our average precipitation. And then looking at the local conditions across the state, uh, there's a few regions that stand out as being especially drier than normal last year. Uh, one of those is down across the Southern Mountains. Uh, we had some of our climatological wettest spots in the state that finished notably dry last year. Uh, one of those is Highlands in southern Macon County. They average almost 90 inches of precipitation per year. They only had about 70 last year, so they were a little over 18 inches below normal. I uh, did not label the map, but just next door uh, in Transylvania County is Lake Toxaway. That is our dry or wettest site in the state, climatologically speaking. They average more than 90 inches of rain per year. They only had about 75 last year, so another site that finished uh, more than 15 inches below average. And you can also see a drier area out in the western Piedmont and then another getting into the northeastern part of the coast. Uh, this is a, a region in particular that it was dry during the fall, but they were also dry earlier in the year, and we'll see some evidence of that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so because of that, places like Greenville and Elizabeth City both, both finished the year between 7 to 10 inches below their normal precipitation. It was the eighth driest year on record for Elizabeth City. Elsewhere, it was pretty close to normal, factoring in both the wet and the dry periods. Uh, places like Greensboro, Raleigh, Wilmington, all finished within about two inches of their average precipitation uh, for the entire year. So that gives you a very high level overview of what the temperatures and precipitation were like last year. At this point, we can start going through on a season by season level, what were some of the notable events, some of the patterns that shaped our weather, and some of the highlights with our weather. And in this case, for the winter, if you're a snow lover, we'll start with probably what's a low light. And that's that we really didn't see much snow at all last winter, especially outside of the mountains. Uh, you can see most of the Piedmont, most of the coastal plain had zero snow for the entire year. Even in the mountains, places that got snow had less than their average amounts. Uh, Mount Mitchell is a good example. Our highest elevation point in the state, they average almost 90 inches of snow per year there. They only had about 20 last winter, so that shows how far below normal they were. In places like Asheville, at least at the airport location on the southern end of Buncombe County, they finished the entire calendar year with zero snows. So uh, that's kind of rare for that part of the state. And it's also something that we saw in places like uh, Raleigh, Charlotte, Wilmington, much of eastern North Carolina. No snow for the calendar year in 2023. Uh, one big reason for that was just how warm our temperatures were. Uh, for the, the first part of the winter, at least in January and February. Uh, the graph here is a little bit busy, but I really like the way it shows the data. Uh, the blue bars here are the daily temperatures, so the range between uh, the daily low and the daily high temperature. And you can compare that with the, the colors in the background. The browns in the middle are the average or the normal values for this time of the year. Uh, the reds are getting into more of the extremes, and then the blues are on the cold side of the extremes. What we can really tell here is in the Raleigh area, and this is true for most of the state in January and February, we had very few days that dipped at all below normal. We had a lot more days that were above normal in January and February, including a number of days where we uh, were at or near record high temperatures. 
Uh, that included a, a spell of a couple days in late February where it made it up into the low 80s. Uh, those were temperatures more than 25 degrees above normal for that time of the year. So again, I think that kind of puts into perspective how warm it was. It felt not even like spring, almost like early summer uh, during the, those few stretches in the winter time. So easy to see why we didn't get much of any snow uh, during the winter time. The other big story for our winter last year was uh, some of the large scale patterns, especially the La Nina pattern uh, that was still in place going into the winter. Uh, this was the third winter in a row where we had been dealing with this La Nina event. And La Ninas tend to be warmer and drier in the wintertime for North Carolina. Uh, you can see from the stats up at the, at the top right here, it was a warmer winter in North Carolina, but really not drier. It was closer to normal uh, in general across the state. And I think that's probably the main theme of this three-year La Nina. We had a few shorter-lived dry stretches and droughts, but no real prolonged or widespread drought across the state. And when you look back on this graph of other recent El Nino and La Nina events, you can see another long-lived La Nina in the late 90s and early 2000s. If you were around here during that time, you remember that was a pretty bad drought in North Carolina. There were some areas that were basically a full year's worth of rain below normal over that two or three year period. So again, fortunate, I think, that we had the rain that we did over the last three years to avoid more widespread dry impacts uh, from that long lasting La Nina. So going into the springtime, we talked about how warm the end of winter was. That warm weather really just carried over into March. Uh, the graph here on the left shows that the temperatures in the Wilmington area, we had a number of days in early March that were in the 70s, touching on 80 degrees. Uh, we've seen cases like this many times in recent years where we'll finish the winter on a warm note, but inevitably in all these cases, we'll still get a few below freezing nights that are pretty much on their normal timing in March and April. And that's exactly what happened this last year. The average last spring freeze date in the Wilmington area is right around the middle of March. And they saw two nights in mid-March where the temperatures dropped down below freezing. So fortunately, uh, those were fairly short-lived events. We did not have prolonged freeze damage uh, to most crops or plants from those. And then you can see we warmed up again very quickly right after that, again, into the 70s and 80s. So in the Wilmington area, those azaleas were in full bloom a little bit earlier than normal uh, at the end of March. The other big feature of our springtime was uh, the varying rainfall patterns across the state. March and the first part of April were quite a bit drier, especially in the eastern part of the state. If you remember that map we showed, uh, the northeastern corner of the state was fairly dry for the year overall, but they were especially dry in the spring. Uh, and when we see dry conditions like that in the springtime, a common impact is wildfire activity. We did have several wildfires uh, along the coast in the spring, including this one. Uh, this is at the Croatan National Forest uh, down in Craven and Jones counties back in April. 32,000 acres burned by this one fire in late April, a very fast spreading event with some of the high winds and dry conditions that we had for a few uh, for a few days later in the month. But luckily, by the end of April and early May, we started seeing uh, more frequent rain coming through, especially in the eastern part of the state. That helped to tamp down a lot of that dryness and some of the fires that were going on. And then we started to see even flooding in some areas, but also we saw a nice rainbow on the horizon in parts of the coast as we uh, headed toward the end of April. So what they say about April showers was definitely true this year. It led to a, a nice growth of May flowers as we moved in to the end of the spring. The other thing people started to notice around that time of the year is that it only seemed to rain on the weekends. We put together this graph that they showed between January and April. It really was raining more often than not uh, during the weekends. And there were parts of the state, like in Raleigh, where they had at least a trace of precipitation on all but one weekend during the first four months of the year. So kind of an interesting coincidence uh, with our weather at the start of the year. Of course, we know it didn't stay that way after that. We didn't see rain every weekend throughout 2023, but at least it felt that way uh, at the very beginning of the year. As we switched into May and then especially into June, uh, that's when, as you remember that temperature graph, we saw those cooler conditions across the state. We did have a cool start to the summer, mostly with, with low pressure and troughing the jet stream to our north and over the northeast. So those northerly winds pulled in cooler air, but also that's when we started seeing those some of those Canadian wildfires burning to our north. So that pulled in some of the smoky air, and we saw very hazy skies over parts of the state. 
uh, the photo here on the right shows the skyline of Winston-Salem with this kind of orangey haze in the air uh, back in, in June. There were also uh, some notably bad air quality days during that time of the year. Several days where the forecasted air quality was up in the code uh, orange, code red, even code purple ranges, which is something that fortunately we haven't had to deal with in North Carolina very much in recent years. But we did have several days where uh, the air quality was fairly hazardous here early in the summer. But again, it, the, the cooler weather was really just confined to May and June. Once we got into July and especially August, we saw that more typical summer-like heat return. Uh, the graph here shows those temperatures for the Greensboro area. And you can see some of those very cool days during the month of June. Uh, but Greensboro had its first 90 degree day of the year on July 1st. And from there on through the end of August, it was fairly common to see more of those days with temperatures in getting up into the low to mid 90s. They still finished the year with almost a month's worth of those 90 degree days overall. So even if you remember it as not being a very hot summer early on, it was still a very typical and, and even hotter than normal summer for uh, the, the latter part of that season. Uh, once we got later in the summer and toward the peak of typical hurricane season, that's where we started to see more of that activity in the Atlantic and also here in North Carolina. Uh, the first tropical storm that affected us uh, in the year was Tropical Storm Adalia. You can see from the track here, it mainly passed to our south, but there was still some, some pretty impressive rainfall across the southern and central coastal plain. Some areas saw more than eight inches and even close to nine inches uh, just from that one storm, along with some fairly gusty winds at the coast uh, during that event. A few weeks later, in mid-September, we saw another storm, Tropical Storm Ophelia, move through. This one made direct landfall along Emerald Isle and continued up across the northern part of the coast. And some of the hardest hit areas, at least in terms of rainfall, were New Bern, uh, Greenville, Washington. They had six to seven inches of rain from that event. And also with the winds pushing that water uh, up some of the rivers, they saw some storm surge and flooding uh, during that storm. Now, one thing you may have noticed uh, from both of these storms is that they were pretty wet events in the eastern part of the state, but areas in the west really didn't see much of any rain at all from either of those systems. So as a result, when we started getting into the fall, into October, we already had some areas that were dry and even in drought at the beginning of the month. And then by the end of the month in October, we had pretty widespread moderate to severe drought across the western half of the state. Uh, this is a pretty typical case of what we sometimes call flash drought, where you can have just a few weeks of very warm, very dry weather that leads to that rapid drought expansion and, and also seeing impacts from the drought. Uh, fortunately, this drought began really right after or near the end of the growing season. So it did not have as much impact on agriculture, on some of the crops that were still in the ground, but there were more widespread impacts to other sectors. Uh, one of those was on surface water levels, just without much rainfall at all, especially for about a month between mid-October and mid-November. We saw a lot of the river and stream levels drop quite a bit. Photo on the left here shows the Catawba River out of McDowell County. You can see just how much of the bank is exposed on either side of the river there. So we can tell it is probably a few feet below its normal levels. Also, just like in the spring, whenever we get in the fall and we start to, to pack up those uh, dry days back to back, uh, we have to worry about wildfires, and we did see several large wildfires in the mountains uh, this fall. Uh, one of those you see on the right here was the Colette Ridge Fire uh, out in Cherokee County that burned uh, almost 20,000 acres. So uh, there were several of those events, and I know some folks had mentioned they remember uh, seeing those fires and some of their smoke uh, back uh, during the fall season. Also, it was really remarkable to see just so that lack of rain during the fall, how fast some of the lake levels had dropped off. Uh, the photo on the left here shows Jordan Lake, which is one of the supplies for the Triangle area, and just how low it had gotten by late November, early December, lower than we had seen in many years, and low enough that in some places you could walk out to what's usually the middle of a lake, uh, right on the, the sand there. There were even places where you could walk toward uh, the old roadbeds and some of the building foundations that had been flooded when the lake was created uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, since many of our lakes are also water supplies, we did also start to see uh, some water conservation measures and even mandatory restrictions implemented. The city of Hendersonville in the western part of the state uh, was one area that had began to encourage uh, voluntary water conservation to make sure that their own supplies would hold out uh, throughout the fall season until we started getting into uh, a wetter pattern. 
And fortunately, that wetter pattern did return by December. If you read our uh, winter outlook back in November, you know that we were really not expecting uh, those wet conditions to start until maybe early 2024. But instead, as we moved into November, we started seeing those regular rain events. Uh, this graph here shows precipitation totals on the Newburn area. They had three solid rains in December that each totaled more than two inches. And one of the big culprits behind that was this El Nino pattern that had, mer had emerged. Uh, so during the year in 2023, we had seen that transition from a La Nina into an El Nino, uh, characterized by this warm water across uh, the equator in the Pacific Ocean. And one of the side effects of this El Nino is changes to the atmospheric patterns, especially bringing in a lot more of these moisture-rich weather systems uh, from the south and southwest. And again, that's exactly what we've been seeing here over the last month or so. Uh, lots of fairly frequent, very wet uh, rain events uh, across the state. So uh, one last part for me, I wanted to talk about some of the hazards that we experienced uh, over the last year. We mentioned the two tropical systems that we dealt with here in North Carolina. Uh, overall, it was a very active tropical season in the Atlantic, 20 tropical storms in total throughout the year. But of those 20, only three had any direct impact on the United States. Uh, those were, of course, uh, Idalia and Ophelia that we felt here in North Carolina. And then there was also Harold that made landfall uh, in South Texas over the summer. But again, knowing the level of activity that we had during the season, uh, we actually maybe got off a little bit easy only having a couple systems here locally. Uh, more of those storms stayed out over the open ocean and really never reached land at all. So you can, it, on one hand, look at that as a bit of good news. On another hand, it was bad news because the time of the year where we were expecting more of that rain from the tropical storms during the fall is the same time where we didn't see any rain from those systems and instead we entered uh, some of those uh, extreme drought conditions. So uh, like them or not, we do rely on tropical systems for a good chunk of our rainfall at that time of the year. So missing out on those systems, uh, especially in October, uh, did contribute to that uh, worsening drought uh, that we felt. Uh, also, we had a number of tornadoes across North Carolina last year. Uh, those include some from our tropical systems. You can see at the southern coast, uh, a cluster of tornadoes from Idalia, and the northern coast, one from Ophelia. But aside from that, a number of tornadoes associated with severe weather events, really in all seasons of the year. Uh, there were 21 total tornadoes confirmed by the Weather Service last year, and that's the most in a single year since 2020. A few things about this map that I wanted to point out where our tornadoes happened and when they happened. One of those is that we had three tornadoes during the winter season. Uh, there were two in January and then the one in Garner and Wake County uh, back in mid-December. Historically, wintertime tornadoes are fairly rare in North Carolina. For many years, we only averaged about one per year. But last year, we saw three. We've already seen several so far in January this year. And just over the last decade, those have become more common as we're seeing more spring-like and fall-like weather uh, carrying over into the winter. You notice on this map, there's kind of a gap across the Piedmont, so not as much activity in that region last year. But we had more tornadoes in the western part of the state, including in the mountains. You can see there was a tornado in Yancey County that tracked into Mitchell County. That was the first ever tornado recorded in Mitchell County. There was a tornado in northern Avery County. That was the first in Avery County since 1965. And then there was one in May down in Henderson County. That was the first tornado recorded there since 1977. So uh, these are tornado events in parts of the state that we don't usually see uh, those events happen. And then one final thing to note is the strongest tornado of the year. I'm sure folks remember hearing about this on the news uh, out in uh, Nash and Edgecombe counties in mid-July, an EF3 tornado north of Rocky Mount. Uh, that was the first EF3 tornado in North Carolina in the month of July. So another unusually strong tornado at a time of year when we don't necessarily expect to see uh, storms like that. Uh, we had a number of flood events throughout the year and not just from our tropical storms. In late April, in June, in mid-July, uh, we had places that flooded really just from some heavy rain showers that set up over areas over a longer period of time. Uh, and you can see uh, in, in June even caused some flooding in and around the Charlotte area. Once we got later in the summer and into the fall, we did see those tropical systems move through and cause some flood impacts of their own. Uh, one of those uh, from Tropical Storm Idalia happened in the Whiteville area. Or the precipitation map we showed from Idalia showed they had about eight and a half inches of rain from that storm that caused widespread flooding throughout the city. 
2023 was the five-year anniversary of Hurricane Florence. And frankly, you can look at a picture like this, and you'd be remiss if you thought this was Hurricane Florence because the level of flooding well, was so severe. And then, as we mentioned, in September from Ophelia, we had flooding in places like New Bern and Washington and Greenville, both from the storm surge, but also from some of the rainfall falling uh, in those areas and, and causing the river levels to spike. Uh, the flip side of the coin from flooding is drought. Uh, and I, I don't think it's fair to say that 2023 was a year of drought because we did have several months in the late spring and early summer with no drought across the state, but certainly it was something the parts of the state were dealing with at different times in the year. Uh, the chart at the top here just shows throughout the year from January through December, the percent of the state that was classified in each U.S. drought monitor category during the year. You can see at the beginning of the year, we did have that drought mostly across uh, southern and eastern North Carolina, like we talked about. That faded by late April, early May, thanks to some of the rain that we had then. But then it began creeping back in, first in the western part of the state by late summer, as those areas missed out on the tropical systems. And really by the middle of fall, by late October, early November, that's when the drought was at its peak. Uh, parts of the state in the southern mountains were classified in the extreme drought level. Uh, this was the first time we had had any extreme drought in North Carolina uh, since the spring of 2017, when we were coming out of that bad drought that started the previous fall. So some unusually severe drought that we haven't seen in several years. But again, thankfully, with some of the rain that we've had in December and now in January, we have seen some of those drought conditions fading, and we've just been left with a little bit of that lingering drought across far western uh, North Carolina. And again, one side effect of drought in our state tends to be wildfire activity. Uh, the statistics that the North Carolina Forest Service has shared with me are still being finalized, but they show uh, almost 5,500 wildfires last year. That is up from the 10-year average of about 4,200 fires. Uh, and they're looking at about 76,000 acres burned. Now, they typically track this acreage only on state and private lands. This figure also includes uh, some fires on federal lands, like that big fire in the Croatan that they assisted on. So the final numbers may change a little bit, but overall, it's safe to say that this should be the most acreage burned by wildfires in a year in North Carolina since 2016. And again, that was a really notable year for uh, that fall drought and, and fire season. Uh, so with that said, uh, it's now time to look at the year in perspective. I'm wondering if Kathy has made it on because she was going to cover this part. So Kathy, are you, are you here? Corey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And sorry that I couldn't make it four years of Zooming and we're still having problems. But we in the State Climate Office work across all 100 counties. I'm down in Carteret County today, and everyone on our staff has gotten used to me taking calls from the car and whatnot. So thank you all for your patience. Uh, Corey, you'll have to drive for me. Next slide. Yeah, so we just wanted to wrap up and put this into a larger perspective for all of you that this has really been a yin and yang year. They started off with an La Nina, which we had three of those. We ended with an El Nino. The cool seasons were warm. The warm season started cool. I'm thinking back to last summer when folks were getting really anxious. We hadn't hit 90 degrees yet. And I kept saying, wait for it, wait for it, it's coming and you'll want this cool weather back. We had rain every weekend in the beginning of the year like uh, Corey detailed and then we plunged into uh, some drought conditions. We had tropical torrents and uh, also some extreme rainfall that was non-tropical while drought was emerging. So we held those two things together at once. And then a winter drought in the east and a fall drought in the west. So while this does balance out, we do note that each one of these are an extreme in and of themselves and we're seeing these extremes increase in part due to the next slide. So it was our warmest year on record globally. This was announced last Friday uh, by both NASA and NOAA data. They keep really careful records and our friends up in Asheville at National Centers for Environmental Information are a part of this. And the last 10 years have been the 10 warmest years on record. So we know that this is a pattern. These headlines are sadly unsurprising these days and we are seeing the impacts here in North Carolina. And when we knew that there was going to be an El Nino, we, we knew that it would be a warmer than normal year. El Nino tends to turn up the global temperature. Uh, it, it keeps our, our weather a little bit uh, cooler and wetter sometimes here in North Carolina, but overall on the planet, it, it makes it warmer. And I just really like this graph on the bottom, which shows the different phases. Red is El Nino, 
blue is La Nina, uh, the gray is neutral, and we're warming in each of the phases. So even in those La Nina years, we're seeing warmer than normal temperatures. Next slide. And this plays out on the ground. You know, we talk about global temperature. So what? What does that mean for me and my family and the things that matter to me? And there's a whole host of issues that cross the billion dollar thresh mark, uh, threshold in the US in the past year, including hailstorms, flooding, uh, severe weather in, in the Midwest. Uh, there was severe weather all over, uh, winter weather, but notably there aren't any huge hurricanes on here. So we're seeing the billion dollar disasters happen you know, across the board and all the disasters they track and we also note that disasters happen to communities and sometimes don't meet the billion dollar threshold or things like heat and extreme heat are really hard to categorize when you don't have a direct economic impact. So we're seeing the fingerprints of climate change all over our country. Next slide. And we're seeing them here in North Carolina and Corey detailed a lot of this really nicely. A lack of snowfall. It's It was 61 degrees in Beaufort today. Uh, I know it's snowing across the country. Warm season, cool temperatures. So you know we're we're tricking our trees and our plants, and they're blooming a little bit earlier. And then those cool season, those cool temperatures will follow through. So we're seeing these wild swings between warm and cold, and in seasons that are supposed to be cold. It was hot this summer. We saw that especially in July and August, and we saw our overnight temperatures uh, stay pretty elevated as well, especially in the beginning of July. And notably, our friends at the National Weather Service in Raleigh issued a heat advisory for overnight temperatures during one of these hot spells. So we're used to seeing them during the day, but we have to worry about our hot temperatures overnight as well. Wintertime severe weather, uh, we saw this last Tuesday, that's 2024, and we'll talk about that in, in next year's recap for you, but the tornadoes that Corey detailed and also uh, some severe thunderstorms. And then these precipitation strings, uh, swings, managing flooding and managing drought. So when we get these four or five, six inch events that happen in a city in a place that's already experiencing drought. So, so how do you manage these two things? And going forward, we're expecting to see more of the same in a warming climate. And I think, Corey, next slide. Yeah, so for more on climate change impacts, we uh, kept it pretty brief for this uh, webinar. You can join us on Thursday. We're going through the Southeast chapter of the National Climate Assessment. We're focusing on four key messages and having a conversation around relevant climate impacts in the Southeast. So the National Climate Assessment was released uh, last November by Congress and uh, the Biden administration, but it's an independent science review of what's happening in climate in the US. So please join us. And with that, we will take questions. I will moderate it and we will also uh, publish a climate blog summary at noon. We will post the recording on our YouTube channel and I saw something in the chat. Uh, yes, we can share the slides as well. So thank you so much, Corey, for your wonderful recap and thank you everybody for your attention. And now we'll turn the floor over to you to ask some questions. So some folks want the link to the Thursday meeting in the chat. So Bobby, if you can put that in the chat, that would be wonderful. Will do. I'm gonna scroll through um, a few questions. So one is for the cities, does the growing urbanization and resulting heat sinks and islands affect measuring temperatures comparing to historical values? when there was less urbanization. It's certainly a part of it. A few cities in North Carolina have done an urban heat mapping project, including Raleigh and Durham, Asheville, and I know Charlotte's hoping to do one uh, this summer. We see warmer temperatures in urban areas, especially those without proximity to green space, but we're seeing the temperatures increase overall and we're seeing rural temperatures also increase pretty rapidly. So urban heat doesn't necessarily explain all of the warming, but it's certainly a concern, especially in some of our lower income areas. Let's 
So there's a question about, does adding the larger buildings add to the heat? Certainly, um, yes, adding built infrastructure to our cities and our landscapes does add to heat, but there are engineers and architects putting uh, measures in place, either using green infrastructure, green roofs, to cool down an area, or um, all sorts of engineering feats that I can't speak to myself, knowing that adding buildings and blacktop and concrete does add to the heat of a city. I'm gonna toss this one to Corey because I've just rambled, but what do you make of the active hurricane season in a year that started La Nina? Are we expecting an active hurricane season this year with El Nino? Yeah, you know, 2023 was a really interesting year uh, in large part because how much uncertainty there was going into the season about what the activity would look like. The forecast that the Hurricane Center put out back in the spring was showing they expected near normal activity probably, but there was, a, a, you know, still a decent chance it would be above normal or below normal. There were these competing factors. On one hand, the water across the Atlantic was at record warm levels going into the summer and even throughout much of the summer. So we know that warmer water in the ocean encourages more development. On the other hand, we knew that we were seeing this El Nino take shape. Historically, El Nino tends to strengthen the, the winds that blow across the Atlantic that can shear apart more of these systems as they're developing. So there have been plenty of recent cases even in El Nino uh, years where uh, once you get that El Nino effect kicking in, it really stops a lot of the activity in the Atlantic. So again, we weren't really sure which one of those effects would win out. It turns out that warm water in the Atlantic was a real driving factor. So that's why, especially as we got into August and September, we just saw that flurry of storms begin to form, especially out over that main development region between Africa and the Caribbean, where those waters were the warmest. Uh, by maybe late October, early November, that activity died down a little bit. But again, the kind of the damage had been done by that point. We had already seen those 20 storms form. In terms of what it means for 2024, the forecast right now showed this El Nino staying in place through the winter, but probably fading by the time we get into the spring. And that is a very typical evolution of an El Nino event. They rarely stick around beyond the winter times. So that El Nino really may not make itself felt in the next hurricane season. It may depend on whether we're transitioning into a La Nina or at least neutral conditions by then. But I would say I know even over this winter, we're still seeing near record warm sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. So a very early outlook for this coming hurricane season would probably be you can expect more activity as long as the Atlantic is staying warm. So Corey, this is for both of us. I'll take a swing and then you can answer. Appreciate the fingerprints of climate change slide. As we look to this presentation, what are some of the metrics that concern you the most as climatologists? So I will say, at essentially the lack of our adaptation to these things. We know it's getting warmer. We know we're seeing more flooding and more droughts, uh, hotter summertime temperatures with reduced ability to adapt. Um, and even things, and, and this is you know something that we do when we're working in all 100 communities, talking with folks about what they love, about where they live, the lack of snowfall has been really bothersome to a lot of folks in North Carolina who have just been hoping for half an inch of snow. Um, it's been noticeably absent. And you know we like to go out and hit our ski hills and go snowshoeing or even just have a day inside enjoying the snow. So I'm also worried about the loss of sense of place and culture and the, the things that we really love about this state. Corey? Yeah, I'd say from my side with my job, I serve as our office's focal point on North Carolina's Drought Council and also do a lot of work with the North Carolina Forest Service and the U.S. Forest Service, folks that deal with a lot of our big wildfire events across the region. And I think the impacts that we're seeing on those areas where our dry spells are getting even drier, even more pronounced, even more impactful, and where some of those impacts are including more frequent and larger uh, wildfire events, those are definitely concerning, and I feel like my you know, involvement in those areas has helped me kind of feel indirectly the impacts that those folks are dealing with. We had what was supposed to be a statewide meeting about wildfire conditions and monitoring in November. They got canceled because so many folks had to deploy to the western part of the state to deal with those events. I would say 
the the other concerning part about that is just that this creates a lot of uncertainty for folks. We didn't know going into the fall that we were going to, within two months, be in the middle of this extreme drought. Uh, that's a time of year, again, where we might expect more rain due to tropical systems and having this El Nino brewing expected that we might even have wetter conditions coming soon. So uh, a lot of these drought events are very flashy. They're emerging more quickly and they're having faster and almost more unpredictable impacts. So those are, are definitely concerns that we've seen not just in 2023 and not just in North Carolina, but in other regions and in other recent years. Corey, I'm going to continue on the USDA drought thread, all kind of related. Can you comment on the recent change in the USDA plant hardy, hardiness zone map? So I've only briefly had a chance to look at that. So uh, unfortunately, I can't really say exactly what those changes are for, for North Carolina. Uh, I, that's something it's been on my list to, to, to take a closer look at, but this time hasn't, hasn't allowed it so far. But as far as I'm aware, this is something that they update maybe every five or 10 years or so. And it's usually based on the, the minimum temperatures that have, like the coldest temperatures that have happened over maybe the last 20 or 30 year period. So I would assume that their logic at least is, is the same, but it's just that the lines themselves and the zones on, on the map that, that have changed a bit. Yeah, and sorry, I threw that to you. Um, yes, some of the zones have increased by about a half uh, due to warmer overnight temperatures, but as we're seeing, in the middle of the country right now, winter still happens, cold temperatures still happen. So it's not as an aggressive of a shift as I think we were expecting, but it does reflect that we are getting warmer and plants are shifting northward or upslope into cooler temperatures. I will. So, um, Concerns about possible sea levels rising. Yes, I'm looking out over Bogue Sound right now in a meeting with folks from Harker's Island and down east, and they're seeing the impacts of sea level rise now. Places flood without a hurricane or a big storm. We see sunny day flooding, so high tide flooding when you, know, you wouldn't expect it. Uh, people can point to places that flood now in hurricanes that never flooded before. So. That's certainly something that we can measure. And one of those fingerprints of climate change, warmer water just takes up more space, but also the melting ice caps as well. So it's something that we are paying close attention to in North Carolina and one of our other climate stressors and disruptors. Corey, do you see more crop damage from insects due to warmer winters? That's a good question, yeah. So invasive species have become a bigger problem in recent years. Uh, one reason is just that these invasives are a little bit better adapted to a wider range of conditions, but we're also seeing invasives come in from areas like places to our south that are more tolerable of a warmer climate overall and can better overwinter when we don't have that same uh, colder weather during the wintertime seasons here. So we certainly are seeing more invasives overall, but that includes some of the ones that are, are damaging to our crops. Uh, one that I think of in particular is the, the Christmas tree crop, the Fraser fir trees. Right now, there's only a very small range that includes uh, parts of the mountains in North Carolina where those can be grown. They've had a lot of bugs, these invasive bugs now that are beginning uh, to deplete uh, those Christmas tree farms. Last year, they had some uh, drought conditions that also hurt their crop. And then in addition, we're seeing just the, the lack of cool enough conditions for those Christmas trees to grow. Uh, and uh, in some cases during last winter, they hardly had any cool nights at all and more of the warm days that are also uh, stressors for, for those. So uh, that's definitely, you know, all across the state, even in our highest, coolest mountain spots, uh, something we're seeing more of now. Corey, I'll ask you a question and you can ask it back at me. Um, you spend a lot of time thinking about North Carolina's climate and weather. You're the person that we all go to and ask these questions. Was there any single event or instance in the past year that made you say, whoa? So is, is this open-ended whoa about climate change or whoa about, wow, that's, that's just an interesting event? Both. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, th th this is tough. I, I, I'll start off by changing your question and making it easier on myself. <laughs> my, my favorite weather of the entire year was back in the middle of February. The NHL played an outdoor hockey game here in Raleigh on February the 18th. 
If you remember those graphs, we had this wall-to-wall -wall warm weather through the entire month of February. I was fully prepared to go to that game in, in shorts and short sleeves, but we had one good cool night on February the 18th where the temperatures uh, dipped down into the 30s. So just perfect weather to be outdoor for a hockey game. So that event made me go, whoa, in a really cool way, as in I can't believe we're playing hockey outside in, in North Carolina. Uh, in terms of, of other events, I, I, we talked about the fall drought. I think that's got to be one that knowing both how extreme it ended up being, but also how fast it got there and seeing that between mid-October and mid-November, places like Charlotte and Asheville didn't even see a drop of rain. That's the type of prolonged dry spell that, that we fear, that we worry about happening. And I think we saw some, what the impacts can look like. And again, we know that that is those more frequent, more severe dry spells is one of those impacts that that we can expect from, from climate change. Great, thank you. And the first rule of media training is to answer the question you want to answer. So <laughs> thank you for doing that. Um, you know, I really enjoyed the fall foliage this year. It was especially beautiful in the triangle and from somebody who's uh, from the Northeast, it, it was certainly lovely to see, but there were a few woes like the 102 degree temperatures in early September uh, in Raleigh that that certainly made me gasp a little bit. So we have, I'm gonna take one more question. One way to measure so soil permeability and water retention is to compare rainfall to water level in lakes, streams, and rivers. Is there a way for me, the public, to access that climate data, that kind of data? So Corey, you look at that in the drought, um, the drought council can you talk a little bit about that yes yeah, so every week including this afternoon on, on our weekly drought call as a state we'll look at a number of indicators of drought and dryness across the state uh, the u.s geological survey uh, maintains stream gauges and groundwater gauges all across the state those really give us our best indication of what these surface water conditions look like with stream flows we're really looking at kind of the the, the discharge from these streams uh which is you know, stream, streams have their normal base flow, but then also a, an additional flow on top of that. Then with the groundwater levels, like it sounds, this is just looking, uh, you know, deep down beneath the surface uh, at what the water levels look like, whether they're going up or down in response to rain events. So uh, I'm not as familiar with the, the soil permeability part. Uh, there may be ways that our soil moisture data from our Econet stations could help with that, but I'm just not as familiar with, with kind of converting between the two. And I will wrap up with the last question. Uh, does the climate office look at indicators of resilience to current future weather events? Yes. So we are constantly uh, collecting and storing and um, distributing all sorts of climate data. But one of the reasons that we exist is to track baseline conditions for the state. So what should be. And then we put a lot of those events into context. So you saw that throughout that presentation. We're, we're talking about things being seventh, eighth warmest year on record. We're talking about hurricanes and tropical storms, you know, that, that may have caused more flooding than others. We're always looking at events within a larger context, not just on their own. We do work closely with communities, state agencies to help refine some of those metrics. So I see some of our colleagues from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services on here. We are working with them on some heat thresholds and what communities and uh, counties and local health departments might be able to do with that information. We're kind of constantly refining what an extreme event looks like across the state and in various parts of the state at different times of the year. So we are working really closely with that. We aren't just thinking about this is how it was in the past and this is how it will be in the future, but we do use that past data to guide us. And we have four minutes left, so I'm going to give folks a chance to get up before your lunchtime. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Corey and Bobby, for dealing with some of our tech issues up front and also the great presentation. We are really grateful to have this chance to spend time with you each year. We are available at climate.ncsu.edu. We are very easy to reach. If you ever want to send us a question or reach out, we're, we're always happy to hear from you. So thank you and have a lovely day.